ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the IESL for today's public lecture on hot dip galvanizing and related products uh, arranged by the building services engineering sectional committee I would like to introduce our guest speaker Mr. Dilruk De Silva in the front row here of LTL Holdings Private Limited formerly known as Lanka Transformers Mr. De Silva's experience in addition to 15 years in the field also constitutes working for hot dip galvanizing standards for the CEB. He is also a qualified finance accountant and marketeer. Um, so instead of me taking all the time on stage, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Dilruk De Silva and if you'd like to give him a warm round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Riza, for the introduction. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, okay, today I'll be majorly concentrating on this hot dip galvanizing and um, the requirement of something to be galvanized because uh, there's no meaning we talking about galvanizing if we do not identify what is the real requirement for doing it. Uh, for that. I think I will first try to explain you all about the fundamental root cause for this particular subject to be taken into discussion. That is the corrosion. Now let us try to understand what is this corrosion. If you take the technical definition of this particular corrosion, Corrosion is the disintegration of an engineered material into its constituent atoms due to, che due to chemical reactions with its surrounding. That means anyway now if you take steel or any, uh, any other metal, it is some sort of a thing that we have created by giving some energy into it. Otherwise, its raw form is not this. What you see, this particular stainless steel is not its raw form. So, this has some sort of energy. And nature is such that always it tries to go back to its original status, where the energy level is very, very low. So, nature always try to take all these metals into that state. But the problem is, is the moment that nature tries to take it back, the money, effort, everything that we have spent in bringing that particular material into that state will get wasted. So protection has become a must. So that is why we have to identify this particular corrosion and how it is being taken place. In most common use word, this means electrochemical oxidation of material in reaction with oxidants, basically oxygen. So oxidation we generally, it is not 100 percent, but generally we say it is corrosion. Out of all these metals, generally ferrous, the base for any nature of steel is the widely used material in the world. What happens to ferrous? We will try to simply understand this particular reaction. When you expose the normal metal to the atmosphere, atmosphere will contain oxygen. By the same time, it will have moisture. Moisture will come and get contact with this base metal. Oxygen will come and get contact. So what will happen is, it will form ferrous ovaric oxide, again a combination with hydroxyls, which is a very complex formation. The danger as well as the beauty of this particular formation is its penetrating. When a top layer is being formed, it will not prevent further corrosion. 
what it does is it will allow moisture and oxygen to penetrate through that particular layer and it will expose the second layer to to this particular ambient conditions so that means this will react furthermore and the total cavitation of the base metal will take place this is the danger with ferrous so especially if you are dealing with ferrous base metals <coughs> it is very very vital for you all to concentrate on its protection corrosion can come into uh, the picture in different different forms you may have heard different words in corrosion and say pitting corrosion where corrosion is going deep into the thing just like a pit in crevice corrosion microbial corrosion especially when it's with chlorine and water then high temperature corrosion where at that those temperatures uh, maybe around 150 degrees celsius and non oxygen and moisture will not be there but still sulfur will go and do the same thing so when you are talking about a chimney or something about uh, some engineering entity then high temperature corrosion when you are designing the thing you have to make sure that it will withstand for the high temperature corrosion then stress corrosion that means when cold work is being done on steel grains will either get elongated or some sort of a work will be done on the grains and that stress will differentiate the adjoining grains then what will happen is an odd cathode formation will take place and again the corrosion will start and ultimately even the metal erosion is some nature of a corrosion so likewise there are different types of corrosion available in the world i mean world you will fight it and out of all of these corrosions except few which i was talking about this uh, sulfur uh, or sulfur dioxide attacks mainly the corrosion is taking place due to galvanic corrosion galvanic corrosion what is galvanic corrosion let's try to understand this particular thing because it will be very much easy for us to see why the protection has to be done uh now this galvanic corrosion uh, the history of the research based in this galvanic corrosion goes way back into the 17th century and uh, people uh, no father of galvanizing still believes as sir michael faraday because he is the one who understood i mean he identified that different metals react in different forms and their activation is different from one to the other so this is the fundamental philosophy in galvanizing but the practical touch of this particular galvanizing was given by galvani italian engineer who identified how this practically happened in this world so that is why this particular corrosion is named in his name galvani and galvanic corrosion so galvanic corrosion occurs when two different metals electrically contact two different metals now this is how they define but still again ferrous different formation of ferrous can be two two metals as i told you some cold work with a normal steel will be two different metals though it's steel so two different metals electrically contact each other there should be some sort of electrical path in between those two and immerse in an electrolyte electrolyte has to be there it has to have some sort of a electrolyte in or in order for galvanic corrosion to occur an electrically conductive path and ionically conductive path are necessary that means there should be a return current path 
this effect. A galvanic couple, when the more active metal corrodes at an accelerated rate and more noble metal corrodes at a reduced rate. Let's see this particular thing in some sort of a graphical presentation. So, there are, I mean always there should be two different metals. Same metal can be two different. Now, this particular piece, if there's one, I mean one area is covered with, uh, let's, let's assume this as a metal piece and let's, we assume uh, this area is covered with, uh, say, dust. So then, here oxygen concentration is low. This side, the oxygen concentration is high. If one area's oxygen concentration is low and other area's oxygen concentration is high, the rea reactions taking place on these two metals, I mean, uh, on this particular metal piece, these two ends are different. So one will act as the anode and the other one will act as the cathode. So technically speaking, this divides into two different metals. Same metal can be two different metals. If you bend a metal from one particular, I mean if you take a piece of metal and bend from one particular place, that bend itself will get cold work, some sort of a cold work. The energy level in that particular place is high, stresses are more, another area it's less. So that will be the anode. I mean, if you all can remember uh, the school days, there is an experiment where uh, we put uh, wire nail and identify that uh, head and the tip will get corroded fast rather than the stem. Why? Because the same thing principle. Cold working has been taken place on the head as well as on the tip. So, anode will be always the much active area where energy levels are high and there should be a cathode. And this anode and cathode should be immersed inside the electrolyte, some nature of an electrolyte. So there will be, if you take this, electrons can move in between due to this particular electrolyte. Basically ions will move the other way. And then there should be a return current path where you will get the electron movement like this. So always the anode will be the sacrificational element. Anode will sacrifice. Now in galvanized material, cathode will be for us, because in galvanic series, zinc is more active than ferrous. So always ferrous will be the cathode and zinc will be the anode. So zinc emits two electrons and may sink two plus. And those electrons will go through this return current path, this path to the cathode. And here the ion movement will take place from anode to cathode. So this is how, by this being taking place, what will happen is cathode will get all less protected. So here the cathode will be the ferrous or steel. So by doing galvanizing, in worst scenarios, what will happen is anode will sacrifice, but still the base metal will get protected. That means structure will have its protection. So, let us see how can we prevent this particular corrosion. Now, we earlier we were talking about the corrosion. Now, we saw how it is being taking place. How can we prevent this? Number one is Barrier protection. Now, barrier protection means, if you can remember my second slide, where moisture and uh, oxygen go and attack the base metal. 
what we can do is we can develop a barrier on top of this particular basement and that barrier is not should not be penetrated then moisture and oxygen cannot go and attack or rather the return current path will not be there electrolyte will not come so in that case metal can be prevented by any means by painting or by applying any sort of special coatings or by galvanizing or by doing anything what we do is barrier protection number 2 is cathodic protection cathodic protection means irrespective of the barrier protection if you can give some sort of a sacrificational element then if we get barrier protection now sacrificational <coughs> anode protection sacrificational anode protection means you make sure that the base metal which you need to protect will be always in contact with some nature of a more active metal uh in shipping industry let's say ship hull always exposed to sea water which is highly corrosive because chlorine is a acceleration agent you can galvanize that hull so mere barrier protection is also not effective because sea is very rough you will get quite a lot of other foreign elements in contact and damage the painting and everything so what do they do they do this barrier protection no, sorry cathodic protection they put zinc pieces along the hull and uh, if you go to a ship you can see the levels of this uh, water layers are been marked so they fix that particular pieces in such a manner where uh, sometimes the piece of this zinc goes into the water and other pieces on the top of the water so that means two different metals are i mean they weld it to the hull then it is the in touch with the hull so automatically zinc will be the sacrificational element and hull will get protected so this is being done this is being done in practice in engineering then number 2 is impress current cathodic protection impress current cathodic protection is uh now if i call i mean recall this particular slide where uh, i will go to that particular thing this slide the electrons move along this particular path and then only an arc will get sacrificed now what will happen if by force if we send the current to the other then this current will get a reverse reaction with the other current and it will nullify so by applying an external force you prevent the electron movement and that prevention will prevent anode being getting sacrificed <coughs> underground pipelines especially in um, petrochemical industries this is being done because sometimes those metals are very very expensive so this is the other protection system the second form of this cathodic protection so we can do or rather we can use cathodic protection barrier protection as an preventive mechanism for corrosion again barrier protection what is barrier protection 
any major of coating. You can say this conversion coatings, hot metal wax coatings, hot oil depositions, powder coatings, any major of metallic coatings, even paint, which is the most common means of barrier protection, which is widely used in the industry, in domestic areas, everywhere. Painting. But there are pros and cons. Now, the biggest, I mean, you know, painting is a tedious task for maintaining that particular structure. Though it's a protection mechanism, that protection has always associated with its own problems. The number one issue is the surface cleaning. We, I mean, we just paint, but we do not know whether we are painting the correct surface. How long can we expose the base metal to the normal air? Reaction will start within fraction of a second. There is a problem. And other thing is how to clean. Maybe uh, high end cleanings like chemical cleanings or sand blasting, mechanical cleanings like sand blasting, grid blasting may be expensive. But still, for certain structures you need that nature of cleaning. If you do get the proper effect of painting. Then other thing is obtaining an even coat itself is an issue. I have taken few pictures. Let's see, this is a very common picture. And these are big, I mean, uh, small part of a bridge where the edge has got corroded. Why edge? Why not the other areas? If we have seen, always the corrosion starts from edges once after painting. This is something we have to think. Why? Okay. When you are applying paints, most fundamental way of applying paint is using a paint brush. Maybe spray painting the other one. Now when you are applying with a brush, you apply the paint on the flat surface, but not on the edge. What you do is, you wipe the paint applied on the edge again with the reverse movement of the brush. So edge will not have the correct thickness of the painting. Even when you are doing the spray painting, you hold the sprayer perpendicular to the surface. Do we apply it to the edge? No. So it will not get protected. And the danger of this painting is, the moment when one particular area get exposed to the environment and it get corroded, corrosion is penetrated. So the failure starts and this will continue. If you do apply your if you can immerse it in a paint and take it out, then you will have some nature of protection. But applying paint, the mechanisms that we use is not effective. Then other thing is, we cannot reach everywhere. If you take a hollow section, box iron or pipe or whatever, inner surface will be open. So from inner surface the corrosion can start. Though you apply paint from outside, then there may be certain places where you can't apply, you can't put a brush here. So these are, I mean, I have taken some pictures from the day to day life. So, cannot reach the prevail. So there are inherent problems associated with paint. So that is why this galvanizing comes into the picture. Because galvanizing will have some solutions to these earlier discussed problems. What is hot dip galvanizing? It is protection of steel from corrosion. 
by development of a sim coating which has a metrological bond it's not near a surface coating but it's an it's a metrological bonded coating with steel on the total surface of the steel component for galvanization to be successful this has to be there it should be a coating of zinc i earlier discussed why it is zinc cost effective metal which has a higher activation than steel it should be metallurgically bond so bonding power is very high when you do a metallurgical bond if you do a normal application on sur surface that metallurgical bond will not be there then peeling off will be taking place so metallurgical bond has to be there in hot tip galvanize and then uh, it should cover the total surface the third element because earlier i spoke about that impossibility of reaching certain places but in galvanizing you have to make sure that the galvanizing reaches everywhere so this is called hot tip galvanizing what is this metallurgical bond let's see now this is a actual cross sectional picture of a galvanized steel component h can taken place I have taken this particular image from American Galvanizers Association. They have done research, and I have taken this out from their research paper. So base metal is there, and there will be three layers. The most bottom layer is called gamma layer. Gamma layer. So this gamma layer will consist of 75% of zinc and 25% of iron. Now we know ferrous basically we will have body centered cubic metal structure where face centers are empty and carbon goes to these face centers and they form slip planes but still there are vacant places so what will happen is zinc goes into that and form this particular metallurgical bond and then on top of that a delta layer will come into the picture which will have 90% of zinc and 10% of iron so when it moves up to the top surface the concentration of zinc will go up now 75 25 now 90 10 and the other layer is zeta which will have 94 and 6% and very top layer eta layer will have 100% zinc so this is the now this is why i told you it's a metallurgically bond Two metals go into its own structures and metallurgical bond. So the bonding is very high here. Where any other protection bond will not get this particular bonding. So this coating, we will see. I mean, different metals will get different coatings. What? affect this coat that is also we need to understand because at the point of we designing the structure we need to identify the coating thickness to predict its durability and what are the elements that will affect this particular coating structure number one is the surface condition of steel if you have a rough surface coating may be high but it's not too rough surface maybe grit blast by grit blasting you can control the roughness of the surface but too rough will again be deadly why it will increase the coating unbearably and then the top layers will start peeling off though it's metallurgically bonded these in between metal bonding layers there may be slip planes develop and thermal stresses will make thermal cracks and those cracks ultimately by atmospheric normalization can propagate and peeling off will take place so this is why 
surface condition of steel should be properly matched to the intended use. Then other one is the composition of steel. I will explain this in the other slide, but mainly the impurities they are in the steel, mainly silicon and phosphorus, will decide how the sink reaction takes place with the base metal. In general, we recommend silicon should be less than 0.4 percent because then the correct formation of the uh, gamma and zeta delta and gamma layers will take place. And other thing is percentage of silicon plus 2.5 times the percentage of phosphorus should less than 0 0.9 percent. So when you select the proper metal, I mean this is very vital if you are going for main big structures like bridges or something, it's very very vital to select the proper metal. Then you can go for this particular uh, proper coating. And this is how the same coating varies with silicon content, silicon content. So generally when it's in the lower terrain, sink coating will be very high, abnormally high as well as when again the silicon goes up, again it will move up. So generally we recommend the proper galvanizing will take place during this particular zone, 0.15 and 0.25 percent. I was earlier explaining that there should be a proper designing if you to get the proper protection. So always we recommend when you are going for some structure, always the galvanizer, fabricator and the designer should be discuss everything together and design the article properly. Then only you will get the real intended use of this galvanizing. Always you have to give the due consideration for this particular metal design. How? The biggest problem is distortions and warpage or warping. How this takes place? One, one thing is when you join two dissimilar metals, maybe high carbon steel with mild steel. When you immerse it in the molten zinc, the reactions will be two different reactions. So two different reactions will relieve, it, um, relieve its stresses in two different ways and warpage can take place. Expansion can be different. So it will warp, distort that particular structure. The other thing is the cold work done on that particular thing. Now, very common thing is the sheet metal work. Let's say the very common thing in buildings is the mm, cable trays. So if you use metal sheet and if you bend metal sheet, stressors will be there. When you put it into the bath, bath temperature is 450 degrees like and recrystallization temperature of uh, ferrous and carbon will be 725 but still the localized temperature though 420, 450 degrees Celsius the localized areas, microscopic localized area the temperature can be more and then stressors can be relieved. Now this releasing of stressors will always walk the structure. So that is why you have seen sometimes when you galvanize there may be distortions. 
so by uh, applying some sort of uh, clamps and all other things you can prevent this so that has to be done during the design or way of, still again the way of bending has to be properly managed then other thing is the joints i was really also discussing about this particular jointing now lap joint which is not recommended in galvanizing because what will happen when you lap simply will not go through that particular two surfaces because it's very closely bonded but when you do the pre preparation as it then other chemicals will go away and it will accelerate the corrosion in between those two lap layers so generally lap weld lap lapping is not recommended when you are doing welding again you have to make sure that a proper welder should be used otherwise this porosity is everything can create quite a lot of problems welding slag inclusion welding slag can form as a black color uh, formation on the top of the galvanized surface so therefore the welding has to be properly done and generally for bigger structures for fastening using bolts and nuts has to be used so these are elements that we need to give attention or pay attention during the design stage and other thing is the venting and drainage i already also told you that total surface should be covered with the zinc coating let's say if you are if you are fabricating a gate simple example is a gate so you take four pipes cut into 45 degree angle and weld together so the total inner surface is covered now there is no way of seam going into the inner surface number one you can't give it because it will float the density is not enough ferrous density is 7.85 or 7850 kg per cubic meter and zinc density is 7200 kg per cubic meter so the air inclusion itself will make the structure float but the biggest danger is not that inner surface will not get covered so there should be some sort of a mechanism openings from the top top most place as well as the bottom most place we are seeing to enter from the bottom most place and air to get released from the top most place then the total inner surface will get contact with see and the inner surface will also get galvanized that means you will get the 100% protection there so venting and drainage drainage means when you are lifting the structure again the excess zinc should flow out so you have to design that so that is why we always say at the point of design at the advice from a galvanizer should be obtained you to get the proper protection then only the intended use will be satisfied no other thing is in general things threaded surfaces sometimes threaded surfaces when you galvanize you can't use it so you have to power it and you have to get the protection in a different means maybe cold galvanizing or some some other means or sometimes you have to do retapping again so likewise threaded surfaces you have to pay attention on these areas then hinges if you just put a hinge it will solidify and hinging effect will not be there so you have to cover that particular thing this is a laptop see now initial this joint uh, the initial corrosion has started from the bit because inside the surface the cleaning elements are there because inside uh, before coming to the galvanizing bath this goes into the cleaning process which will be basically hydrochloric acid so that is why they recommend not to have lap joints but 
I mean, same structural effect can be obtained by doing some other nature. Loving the inner surface also to reach the sea. This typical distortion, releasing of the stresses during the galvanizing. You can see how this beam has been. So all these things should be designed at the beginning. Now earlier really talking about the warpage now. Bracing has been used for that. So this bracing has prevented galvanizing with this warpage while galvanizing. So there are means of preventing. But again it is, I mean designing should be done properly. Even on this uh, octagonal poles for street lighting. This is one mechanism where we can prevent cable trays getting worn. How bracing has to be done. All these things are, if you, if you, if you go to the American Galvanizers Association website or uh, I mean AGA.com or GAA.com Australian Galvanizers Association of Australia all these I mean new technical papers will be there so anybody can understand that or you can consult a proper galvanizer for that at the point of design in galvanizing we need to slightly touch the process of galvanizing also initially this will be subjected to degreasing because if breezes are there on the surface, those places will not get galvanized. Then rinsing if required after degreasing because degreasing sometimes the agent can be basic. Then pickling using acids, acidic base pickling. So pickling is the most dangerous thing though it gives a cleaner surface for galvanizing. If you have improper design like lapping or something, then it can be deadly. Then rinsing, then fluxing to create a temporary protection because still can't expose to the environment for a long time. The immediately you take it out from the pickling bath, you have to rinse it and make the temporary protection by fluxing. And fluxing itself will uh, react as a wetting agent for galvanizing, zinc coating. Then drying and then dipping inside the zinc bath and quenching if required because there is a series of active uh, 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 baths you have reversed and properly managed. If you do not manage your sink or rather bath chemistry as well as the uh, flux chemistry, you will never get a proper galvanizing. For your naked day, sometimes it is not possible for you to understand. But in long run, you will feel it. That is why a proper galvanizer should be there because the bath chemistry as well as the uh, flux chemistry should be properly managed. And final inspection is very very vital because we have to make sure that the galvanized product should be some nature of an international standard product. Because these standards have been developed in order to make sure that any galvanized will have some nature of a use for the cost paid. So always when you are asking somebody to galvanize, you should see what sort of a standard that, that galvanizer is for. It is very very vital. How galvanizing protects steel? I told you earlier about this cathodic protection and barrier protection, which I will not touch right now. The third one is the patina, zinc patina. Well, the galvanized metal. will react with the oxygen in the environment and, and form zinc oxide which is whitish and then it will react with the hydroxyls in moisture in the ambient and form zinc hydroxide and ultimately this will react with the zinc carbonate in the environment and make zinc carbonate. Now zinc carbonate is a very hard dull grey colour top surface of this delta layer. The topmost zinc layer 
and it is not penetrative. Since it's not penetrative, it protects the base metal again, or the second layer, of the sink layer too. Once you get this particular proper galvanized product, what sort of a life you can expect? Life depends on the environment. Definitely it depends on the environment. And it depends on the coating thickness. But coating thickness you can't go abnormally high because I told you if it's very very high, again the peeling off will take place. It should be wearable to the base structure. So, if you go through any standard, those standards will talk about the uh, coating thicknesses. In general, in Sri Lanka we use BS standards. BS ENISO 1461 of 2009, which is the latest standard available. According to this standard, 86 microns is the recommended level for uh, base metal thic thickness more than 6 millimeter. So what we are talking is somewhere here. Now environment wise, rural environment, if you keep it in a rural environment, your life is more than 100 years because rural environment is not contaminated with any harmful elements. But industrial environment, which is the most dangerous environment where you will have sulfur contamination and every other element. So these environment, again, you can get the life expectation. Cost comparison. The other thing is, now when we are doing some sort of a design, we should know what sort of a protection should be introduced. Why? Because always everything will govern by the economics, nothing else. You can have very top class engineering technology, but still if it is not cost effective, what's the purpose? Why people sometimes prefer Chinese products? You can buy two or three pieces for the same price, which you are paying for a top class European product. Similarly, if it is not cost effective, no meaning doing this. But comparing galvanizing with painting or some other mechanism is just like comparing apples and oranges. Because the base is, a, is two different bases. So you can't compare. And let's say galvanizing charges on weight, but painting generally on surface area. So there are quite a lot of differences. But uh, there are certain people who have tried to develop some thumb rules for this. One is, now we know a one millimeter thick plate will have a surface area, I mean one millimeter thick plate of one metric ton will have a surface area of 254, 254 square meters. If we can remember this 254 element, we know galvanizing one ton will be equivalent to painting of 254 square meters if the base metal thickness is 1 millimeter. So if we are doing some sort of application with base metal thickness of 4 millimeters like 254 divided by 4, you know what is the surface area and you know what is the sandblasting cost per metric ton or something or surface meter, uh, one square meter of surface, painting then easily can compare with the galvanizing cost, cost wise and this is only the initial cost comparison. So this is one very easy, very layman's way of comparing, but still this is very effective. Now, you know with a litre of paint what sort of area you can apply whether it's 4 square meters or 5 square meters. So likewise we can judge this. 
because I, I, I didn't want to do a specific calculation because painting everything depends on the environment. Then it depends on the base metal. Depending on how sort of a thick layer that intended use will cover. So there are quite a lot of other parameters which will govern this. So mere comparison is not effective. Because I really want this lecture, I mean, uh, it to be some sort of a intellectual revolution rather than a marketing tool for galvanizing. So that is why I am giving basic understanding about this for you all to think and design. So the other thing with uh, the painting, which is the most primary way, is uh, now painting, always once you do the painting, maybe after, depending on the environment, maybe after two or three years you have to do some sort of a maintenance, maybe cleaning, patching up or applying anti-corrosion on the rusted areas or some sort of a thing. And maybe after another five years or six years time you may have to repaint it. Again after three years like maintenance, again maybe another ten years repaint. When in galvanizing, if you get the predicted life, the whole total life, you need to do the galvanizing initially and fix it and forget it. So life cycle costing should come here. Now this is merely comparing painting against hot deep galvanized. But other protection mechanisms like powder coating or whatever, you can see the impact. By applying the life cycle costing, the initial cost comparison by the earlier way that I was talking about and life cycle cost comparison will give the total picture, which is the real economic I mean, real economics, because economics governs everything. So this is why I just talk about the way of comparing rather than getting a practical example and compare. Because all these elements depending on the environment, depending on the application mechanism. Now let's say if you are going to have a marine paint, you will have a longer life where maintenance free, longer life. But still, the initial cost may be high there. So, marine paint against normal enamel paint also you can use the same mechanism, life cycle costing. And then, where can we use galvanizing? All structural elements we can use galvanizing. Then fabricated articles like gratings, um, gates, grills, guardrails, handrails, everything you can galvanize. Then reba, uh, rebars in concrete structures you can galvanize. All these in civil engineering, I mean mainly when it comes to the building, you will come across all these things. Now some of these things that we have done, now these are uh, uh, CGR one particular building. Sometimes it is not believable that this is in Sri Lanka, but this is there in Sri Lanka, in Southern Highway. Sometimes you might see these images as some images that we have taken from Germany or USA, but it is in Sri Lanka. If you do it properly, you will get that particular proper effect. Again, this is a structure in Southern Highway. The structures are not painted. Not painted. You can see this, uh, uh, I mean, see patina color there. These are very common things in Colombo. Handrails. Then some architectural elements. Another thing. I was talking about the rebar galvanizing. Sometimes civil engineers do not believe why you should galvanize rebar. But again, as building services engineers, you may have seen this sort of structures. This corrosion is taking place mainly because the rebar or the tow steel being subjected to the corrosion. Even 
Uh, I mean, these are picture we have taken from the America uh, site where total bridge has been collapsed. How this Reba, I mean, the why is the Reba getting corroded? Anyhow, though you give the required concrete thickness for protection, this concrete will have some porosity. Even by spun casting, by giving the proper vibration and everything, still porosities cannot be avoided in concrete. So somehow, moisture and oxygen will reach this fever. And initially, it will give rise to a small crack and this will propagate thereafter. Because when corrosion takes place, the density of ferrosophoric oxide is less than steel. That means, volumetrically, this increases, volume-wise, increases when corrosion is taking place. So this volumetric increase will pressurize the surface. And this pressurize will give rise to cracks. And ultimately those tracks will take off certain pieces out of the concrete. So this is how reba corrosion will destroy the concrete structure. These are not things that I have created, I have taken these out from the civil engineers research papers. And sometimes this uh, believes that after galvanizing, the real bonding power of Riva will not be there. That is also some sort of a myth. Because bonding power, the research says, this is also a research done by American Galvanizing Association. After galvanizing, the bonding power goes up. Because zinc will have a better bonding power with calcium. Why we think its bonding power is uh, Low is uh, we feel after galvanizing the surface is smooth, smoother than uh, the basic rough surface. But the roughness itself will not be the uh, decision making factor for bonding power. Bonding power goes up. And beyond that, especially under sea water structures, the ability to withstand against the chlorides increases from 4 to 5 times. So basically, I just touch about uh, this particular subject matter, which try to make your mind, uh, I mean, inside there should be some sort of an intellectual revolution going on. What to be selected as the preventive mechanism for structures when you are doing the building services. So I think I planted the seed. For you all now to rethink and select the proper way of protecting your associated products. I think uh, I did it as much as possible. So if you all have any sort of questions, now you can ask from me. I will try to answer. I think there's a, I have already taken one hour like. Uh, we can I can answer a few questions if you all have. You mentioned uh, Reba Gabbardite. Yeah. Uh, so the different kind that we use, Reba Gabbardite in building. Yes. That has been used in Sri Lanka. Yes, there are quite a lot of places. Right. In uh, Kalambu Court, when these, uh, mm, what do you call, Lundai constructed this particular jetty, most of these uh, Reba used in the undersea water structure has been galvanized. Uh, so likewise there are quite a lot of places, uh, private places, but uh, commercial, I mean, uh, state owned structure, this is the biggest structure uh, that I have come across in my life. Yes, epoxy coat, I mean, again, it's a matter of cost. And uh, now, it depends, now, if you are doing undersea water, now, epoxy coating should have better withstand against the uh, 
chloride attack. Now, mostly the epoxies are very weak with chlorides, though it is very powerful against moisture. But since being a natural element coming out of from uh, the nature, it has this particular ability to withstand. That is why I earlier mentioned it is four to five times more than the normal way. So then why the reaper can be for and Yes, in Sri Lanka that is the way. But in some other developed countries you get reba available everywhere. You can buy it, galvanized reba. But here, as far as I know, it's not available. Yes. So the, the of that can be uh, yes, definitely, definitely. Now uh, it will restrict by the bath size. Now, if you take uh, the Sapogaskanda galvanizing plant uh, owned by Lanka Transformers, their bath size is seven meters in length, one point three meters in width, and two point one meters in depth. So. If you have an article of somewhere around, uh, I mean, you can do double end dipping also. One end can be dipped and then take it out, and other end can be dipped. So it depends on the architecture of the structure. If it's a linear element, uh, double the size of 7 meter can be dipped there. But in world, there are big galvanizing parts, for example, say. In Korea, Hyundai, they have 18 meter kettle length, so it depends. In Sri Lanka, the galvanizing industry has not been developed that much. So the biggest path available is in Sapkaskanda, which is 7 meter in length. In some cases, uh, we have to uh, rewrite the galvanizing yeah. After building, how to protect the inner surface? Your question. Okay. Let's see. The first thing is, in general, welding is not recommended after galvanizing because welding itself will burn out seam. Because when you are doing arc welding, it will be subjected to 7000 degrees Celsius, where zinc metal uh, melts at 420 degrees Celsius. So zinc get evaporated at 900 degrees Celsius. Evaporated means not merely evaporating, but it's form oxide and get evaporated. So therefore, when you are welding, always the zinc nearby will get evaporated because it passes 900 degrees Celsius. So that is why it is not recommended. But in, uh, I mean, if you do tech welding like thing, it can be accepted because standard says a small damage can be tolerated due to the cathodic reaction of the surrounding area. I can't exactly remember, but standard says it is either 0 0.05 percent or 10 square centimeters, whichever is lowest, can be tolerated. Uh, this is ISO 147, BS1461 recommends this particular thing. So, small rectifications can be done, and that can be done with sink rich coating. But again, when you are selecting the sink rich coating, you have to select this sink rich coating paying attention to two elements. Number one is the sink richness. In general, to have this electron movement, the sink richness should be more than 90 percent. So when you are selecting some sort of a sink rich coating, generally the American Galvanizing Association, the earlier research papers mentioned that it is always recommended that Sink richness more than 90% should be used uh, for this particular electron movement to take place. Number two is the temperature that paint can withstand. Now, sometimes you just weld it, and after two seconds, you apply this particular spray. Sometimes, spray itself will get failed due to the temperature 
on the surface. So sometimes I have seen now, there's a, I can't remember, there was an Australian product where they can go up to 500 degrees Celsius, they can withstand. So likewise you have to see and you have to give proper instruction to the welder also. Okay, after it comes to the room temperature, then apply this particular paint. It depends on the paint also, single spray coating that you are selecting. So those two you can do, but again welding is not recommended, but applying cold, uh, I mean, Sink, uh, sink rich paint is far more better than leaving it there. So that is why I, I earlier also told uh, that always structure should be designed for galvanizing. So then you can use bolting or fix some sort of a other mechanism rather than building. Yes, it's actually not yeah, aluminium, it's sink rich paint. So you can apply that. Provided that it comes within the parameter, I mean uh, the definition given on the calibration in the uh, standard. I think uh, para 6 of the standard uh, talks about the renovation. <coughs> Application of all the use of holes in water joints. The problem we have come across in the site is you have to erect the whole structure, then dismantle it and send it for galvanizing. And then come and erect. That means uh, while doing a maintenance for the existing structure, you're referring? Yeah, maintenance structure, the steel, some kind of steel facade. Yeah, I mean, by I, I didn't get your question exactly, but don't you think that at the point of designing stage, if you pay attention to that, that can be avoided? Yes, but uh, now supposing you take a 20 yard uh, uh, universal beam and it has to be cut down to say 8 foot lengths because that is the lesson of the beam. So you are cutting, you are doing the wedding of the plate to suit that particular location. And after that only then you are sending for. Yeah, yeah, after doing the total fabrication, then only it should be sent for the galvanizing. Galvanizing should be the last stage of this particular series of activities. After galvanizing, it may only fix bolting or whatever and use it. Erection. Yes, only erection part, nothing else. Because it is not recommended that you to do any other work, any other engineering work or not that thereafter. Yes. No, actually, I have taken this particular uh, comparison from again um, American Galvanizers Association's research paper. Uh, it is not uh, merely to Sri Lanka, but again, shall I go to that particular slide again? You are referring to this one? Yeah. Now, they have taken different, different environment. Now, industrial, tropical marine, rural, likewise. Now, Yes, but here uh, the life prediction is not merely due to the humidity because humidity will take place uh, mainly when moisture goes and reacts somewhere. 
But once galvanized, no. Because durability depends on humidity if you are talking about steel. But if you are talking about galvanized steel, humidity will not have a major impact. But maybe the uh, other gases available in the air might have a huge impact. Or rather sometimes the dusty environment, the chlorides available on the moisture may have a better impact. So that is why they take tropical marine. Tropical marine means the chloride content on the air is very very high. Industrial means sulfur for which uh, air. Rural means pure, I mean clean air. So likewise that is why they take because uh, you now galvanized thing you can put it even inside water or you can keep it outside. If water doesn't contain uh, other chemicals like chlorides and all in I mean heavy quantities, basically the life expectation will not have that big difference. But if it is normal for us, yes, that corrodes very much faster than the piece which is outside. So that is why they are not taking uh, moisture into consideration. So that is why humidity has not been a parameter for this particular prediction. But again, humidity can play, temperature can play a role. Because we use the temperature always gives energy for the reaction. So US temperatures are not the temperature that we are experiencing. We are throughout the year, we, we are objected to 30 degrees Celsius like, but in USA it may be very cold during a particular era. So there may be variances here. But I can't just merely draw lines by assuming I have taken this particular thing out of a research paper which they have done. Not I mean this this data is not only from US. This is a worldwide research that they have done. Yeah. Yes. Yes, actually painting will give you enhanced life, which is called duplex protection. In galvanizing, there is a term called duplex protection, which I have not touched because it will time consuming too much. Now, duplex protection means painting over galvanized things. Now, galvanized things, one danger is uneven depositions can again form a bimetallic cell. Let's say this is exposed to a, the coastal line itself. Then what will happen? The sea breeze will come and deposit. And this chloride or salt deposition, uneven salt deposition on the surface will fail the galvanize. So places where this sort of a thing will take place, where electrochemical reaction will take place due to the electron movement, will get protected by another enamel coating which is not penetrating. But enamel coating, the bonding power is very very low. So you get the duplex protection. This duplex protection will give you better protection than galvanizing or painting. So, this nature of uh, advanced protection mechanisms are available. So, it is possible to paint over the Yes. If you are using the normal enamel paints, paint, then there may be a peeling off effect. So, always I recommend H primer to apply rather than the normal primer. H primer is the primer that is recommended for painting over galvanized surfaces. Then it will have a perfect bonding and the perfect duplex protection will be there. Otherwise there are certain other advanced planes where the direct bonding will take place with zinc. Uh, actually, I am not aware about the chemical composition of this particular product that you are talking about. So I think I will avoid commenting on that without studying that particular thing. But anyway, the etching effect has to be there. Now etching effect means zinc surface is very smooth. 
So you have to damage the zinc surface to create some nature of a roughness. So this damaging should be managed. Damaging should be less than 2 microns. If you do more damage, then the reaction of zinc will not be there. So always if you select some nature of a primer like this, you have to see what is the technical damaging that is being done on the zinc surface. And if it is 2 to 3 microns, even 3 microns will be okay for 86 microns. Then again the paint layer, they will recommend that particular paint to have what sort of a coating thickness, maybe 20 microns or something. So then that the damage that has been done for 2 microns will compensate against that 20 additional protection that you are getting. Though it's, I mean, it's not hard, but that protection can enhance the life. The science behind this is that you damage and create some nature of roughness for that to want perfectly with the paint. So always when we are getting some sort of a technical literature about any paint, we have to see whether this effect will be there. I, I, I couldn't hear you. Why trust? Yeah. Generally, it is not recommend to have white rust for a longer durations because white rust is a damaging element. But according to the standard, white rust is not a cause for ejection also. Why? White rust can form because you see on the process of zinc patina, zinc oxide is a part and parcel of this particular life, I mean this life cycle. So white rust means excess zinc oxide formation. When this is being kept, uh, uh, I mean packed one over the other, where moisture goes through or rather water goes through and oxygen also penetrates through and then uh, proper wiping is not taking place, then zinc oxide can excessively form. Now excessively forming of zinc oxide will damage the zinc layer. Delta layer on the top, 100% zinc layer. So white rust is not, but after galvanizing within 2 to 3 months, if this has been exposed and when you open it to the normal air, love uh, 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 this oxides to become hydroxides and carbonides, it will be okay. But if you leave it for one year or more than that, continuously, then it will damage the zinc surface and if you measure the coating, the required coating thickness may not be there. So always storage has to be properly done once after galvanizing. No, no, mainly, I mean, you can apply by different, different means. Dichromation is one particular thing at the point of galvanizing. But chromium is again a carcinogenic. So generally, dichromation is not so recommended. Mainly, uh, round chromium is very deadly. So, always it is, uh, I mean, the most simplest way of doing it is storage, proper storage. Let's say if you do store angle lines, set of angle lines, rather than keeping one over the other, if you keep a piece of uh, some sort of a 2-3 millimeter thick thing and again on top of that, then white rust won't come. It's a matter of mainly storage. Actually there is no protection required, only thing is you should allow proper ventilation. Yeah. After outside direction, white rust generally won't come if it is open to the air. But if white rust comes, you can wipe it out and see what will happen. Generally, the second time, white rust won't come. Where is this particular in uh, place? Generally, this is not possible. Then it not it may not be a white rust. No, generally, no. Even if you take a piece of zinc and keep it open, white rust will form. 
If proper ventilation, I mean, forget about the galvanizing, take a piece of zinc and keep it at that particular place and see whether white rust is coming. Because white rust cannot come, I mean, white rust means zinc oxide, no? So oxidation should take place. Oxidation naturally, when it is exposed to the air, it will form zinc hydroxide and zinc carbonate and finish it off. Why it is not finishing off is maybe some sort of a problematic with the environment. It's some sort of a thing where we need to study and see rather than merely analyzing, but because this is not a common thing. This is a very, very rare thing. This needs some sort of a detailed study rather than commenting. Actually, there is nothing called heavy duty galvanizing, but uh, we use this particular term in our normal day to day things because uh, you know, commonly you galvanize pipes, this sort of things, where you ca cannot allow it to expose heavily to the, this particular temperature, the warpage and everything. So what they do is, now sheet galvanizing and all, it's a continuous process and goes into the bath and immediately comes out and goes out and then brush it. There's a uh, different, different uh, technologies used in this galvanizing. So the thickness is Maybe in sheet metal, you get only 18 microns, 20 microns, pipes, you get that particular temperature, sorry, coating thickness. But normal hot deep galvanizing for fabricated articles should have higher coating thicknesses. As I told you earlier, the generally it should be 86 microns. So this is called heavy coating galvanizing in uh, normal jargon. But different standards will govern these things. Pre-galvanizing means again the galvanized material can be taken back to a galvanizing plant, totally remove the earlier galvanizing, get the base metal surface again to the top after dissolving this particular zinc and pre-galvanizing. This can be done. It depends on the base metal surface condition. If it is earlier painted or something, then you can't chemically remove the paint. So then sandblasting is required. If it is very heavily rusted, until the rusting is peeling off, then again sandblasting or mechanical ways of cleaning is required to uh, get the normal ferrous surface. Because if you don't get the ferrous surface, then reactions will not take place properly. So it depends, sandblasting is required, but if you take uh, very, I mean, newly uh, formed uh, angle lines and if you fabricate a structure with it, there is no need to sandblast. If we send a sandblast, sandblasting yard, and this part from there, and then we come to the Eurojar, is it protected to be given to the tent for the previous year? No, no, but before galvanizing, as I told you, we make it subjected to a series. So we do degreasing, then we do, I mean, uh, different, different things. Pickling is being done. That means using acid, we remove all the uh, rust on top of that, uh, on the surface. But this rust is not the heavily rusted. If you expose a piece of steel for five years for corrosion and then you take it, then this chemical reaction is not enough. Then mechanical means of cleaning is required. Yeah, yeah, that is, uh, that can be managed uh, by the galvanizing. Okay, I think everything is over. Just one question. Uh, uh, surface, you can't get a smooth paint finish, no? Because you can't, uh, the surface by any means, actually, you can't. Yes. Yeah. There is no solution. I would rather say because painting can be done because you, I mean, if you want an exactly perfect thing, then you can use these uh, other uh, 
painting bases to smoothen the surface, which is costly. But still, uh, this itself is a, it can be used as an architectural thing. I have seen even certain buildings, the trusses, the roughness has used as an architectural element. But uh, answering your question, that inherent uh, thing, un even things cannot be avoided. That is inherent to the galvanizing. You can't fix it. Yeah. For that, again, if you want bolts and nuts to be galvanized, the bolt and nut manufacturer, uh, you should give instruction that bolt and nut manufacturer to produce the bolt for galvanizing, produce the nut for galvanizing. Because then he will oversize, I mean, he will tap the nut using the oversize tapping tool. Then, once you galvanize, the sink filling inside will be quite okay and you need to high temperature galvanizing also for that. Then you can fix it. But otherwise, what we do here is now, this, is, this can be done for big orders. If, big orders, like maybe if you want uh, bolts and nuts for one container bolts and nuts, you can order it from the manufacturer telling that you need it for galvanizing and oversized nuts should be supplied. But otherwise, if you are buying nuts and bolts from the open market, you will not get this particular thing. Then you can ask the galvanizer, after galvanizing, not to be retapped using an oversized tool. So, galvanizer will do it for you and th after that again, you can fix it. But only thing is, the inner surface of the uh, nut threaded area, the galvanizing will be removed by retapping. But it will not have a major impact because once you fix the bolt, again the bolt threaded area which is galvanized will be in contact with the inner surface of the nut. That means again the metrological uh, contact will be there and the open air surface will get cathodic protection. <coughs> so it's not that harmful I would rather say. But obtaining, I mean buying oversized nuts is the best solution. But still, this is a way of overcoming the particular problem. Come again? After galvanizing? Yeah, no, to powder, powder coating means uh, you apply this. Uh, yes. So that means there is a bonding there. No? So you can't remove it. So you have to again remove it by either sandblasting or some other chemical means. And after that you can galvanize. But on top of galvanized surfaces you get powder coat. No. Powder coat surface, I mean, any uh, enamel based layers, you can't remove it by pickling because that is acidic reaction. So it has to have some sort of a metallic reaction for pickling. Okay. Right now the galvanizing plants plant manager is there so he will be the best man to talk about the costing part. He is the Lanka Trans Amos Galvanizing Plants Plant Manager. Yeah, for the structural seeds, the galvanizing rate, I can tell you that for tons, around 10 tons, around 10 tons, the galvanizing rate, for a bigger order, like more than 50 tons, you can negotiate special prices. I don't know, these are you. Okay, thank you gentlemen.